certainly with the young man you're referring to, some strange things happened um, overnight, which, you know, that's a story for another day. But again, we got the right people here in this program that signed today, guys that that, uh, that you can win with and you win with people. And, and we certainly got the right guys here. Uh, talking to guys about playing time and how early they're going to play and those t- types of conversations. Yeah. I- I truly believe this. Uh, I've sat in a lot of elite players' living rooms or at their school, and uh, to me, if you're promising a kid that he's going to be your starter, man, if I'm a recruit, I'd be on the lookout. What he promised the guy in front of me, what he, what's he going to promise the guy behind me? Um, yeah, it, it really just gives us an opportunity at the University of Missouri and for our fan base to show the city of St. Louis how we're going to embrace these elite players and why what we're saying is important. We say it's important for these guys to play at home and the opportunities that they're gonna have. And so now as a fan base, um, as business leaders, as supporters, we have to come through with those things and make sure that these players know that playing at home is gonna provide them with significant benefits uh, for their future in the game of football and outside of it. Oh, welcome in the latest episode of that SEC Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And no shame on this show, but uh, hey, don't turn it off just yet because it ain't just going to be be me spieling here by myself. I've got three guests coming on the show. First time we've ever had three different guests on the show, so this is going to be a loaded one here. Wanted to go around the league uh, following the uh, early signing period and you know, we don't want to just completely gloss over that. I know we did uh, a whole hour on it, but really want to spend some time this week, hopefully next, and maybe even the one thereafter, going more in-depth with some insiders that actually cover these teams. So, hey, we like to be the SEC podcast that says we hit on all the teams. So we're going to do our best to get uh, each and every one of these teams and these signing classes covered and this is a perfect time. I don't, we got bowl games coming up. We got a lot of action. We got the holidays coming up. But this will give uh, everybody an opportunity, I think, over the holidays to get some quality content on their team following the signing period. So, hey, before we get to all that, we do have a little bit of news. And I just wanted to make a quick announcement here. You know, I know we always say it. We really do appreciate the five-star written reviews on the Apple Podcast app. Those go a long way. So if you haven't done that, yet and you got an Apple product, go ahead and give us a five-star written review and we're happy to send you a beer koozie free of charge just for doing that. We got all 14 SEC teams represented. And oftentimes we people reach out to say, hey, I don't have an iPhone. How can I leave a review? Well, now we've got a new way because Spotify, as of this weekend, they have announced they are letting fans rate and review podcasts on Spotify. So if you're a Spotify listener, maybe you've always wanted to leave us a review, uh, please do that. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll throw it up here on the screen on how to do that on Spotify. You give us a five-star review on Spotify. Hey, we'll do the same like we do with the Apple. We'll give you a koozie of your choice. Again, we got all 14 SEC teams represented when it comes to koozies. So give us a five-star on Spotify if uh, we, we would really, really appreciate it. And that will help grow the show. But enough of that talk. You're here for SEC football content. We got Keith Allsap of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. He's going to join in just a minute to talk about South Carolina's signing class and the addition of Spencer Rattler to the South Carolina football program. We got Matthew Ray of Sports Illustrated. He covers Tennessee and college football recruiting for SI All-American. He's going to go deep dive on Josh Heupel's first full-time class there on Rocky Top, and we got my man Nate Edwards of Rock M Nation going to talk about Missouri's historic signing class that Eli Drinkowitz managed to bring to Columbia in just his second recruiting class there, and we're going to talk a little bit about the bowl game too because that's the first SEC bowl game coming up this week on Wednesday, Missouri Army, going to be a little bit of a rock fight, so Three outstanding interviews. We're going to get to those in just a second here. But, uh, hey, we got just a few news and notes here. And we kind of already mentioned this on one of the other shows, but it's official now. Max Johnson, former LSU quarterback, headed to Texas A&M. He has committed to Jimbo Fisher's program. And 
What a time in college football where his final pass beats A&M as a member of the LSU Tigers. Of course, Coach O, no longer the coach there in Baton Rouge, his brother, the number one tight end in the country, commits to A&M. All the signs were that Max was going to follow him, and there it is. And you know, I've heard a lot of people questioning this. We got Hayes King here at A&M, just signed a five-star Connor Weigman, I believe is his name, and now Max Johnson. Well, this doesn't make sense, but hell, we just had an A&M season somewhat derailed by not having a quality signal caller in SEC play. You know, I mean, Zach Calzada, he's a hero. He'll always be remembered for what he did against Alabama. But, you know, if he were able to bring that week in and week out, A&M's probably 10-2, and 11-1. and one. It just, it wasn't in the cards this season. And if I'm Jimbo Fisher, I'm looking at, we just signed a number one recruiting class. Program is trending up. We cannot afford a season where we have four or five losses again. And if that hurts someone's feelings because we're adding quality quarterback to the roster, then it's probably not uh, mentally tough to, to go out there and face SEC defenses. So I think this is the way to do it in college football. You load up on as many quarterbacks that uh, aren't afraid of the competition as you can. Let it play out. Guys may transfer. Hell, who knows? Maybe they'll stay. But you can't worry about someone transferring out. You got to worry about uh, you know having the best quarterback play because it – we just saw it. it'll kill you on the field if you don't have it. So add as many talented arms as you can. That's what Jimbo's doing before uh, this number one recruiting class arrives on campus with uh, sky high expectations there in College Station. And speaking of AM, hey, the good news, it ain't over yet because five star defensive back Denver Harris announced over the weekend he has signed with AM. He was kind of keeping it quiet. Beat the Aggies beat out Texas and Alabama for one of the nation's top defensive backs, number three corner, number 17 overall prospect in the 2022 recruiting class. So AM already had the number one class, add another five star. They got another couple five stars they're targeting. We are going to have a Texas AM guest on the next show to break down their historic class. So really looking forward to that. And following that news, Georgia and AM, here's a little stat I dug up here. They had they each have five five stars signed in their current recruiting class. That's more than the Big Ten and the Pac-12 as conferences combined have. So each of them have more than the Pac-12 and the Big Ten combined. That's hey, when they say uh, you know, SEC is is really the highest level of college football, that's what they're talking about. These programs got more talent than they know what to do with. And the rest of college football is just getting lapped at this point. Okay, one other thing. Hey, this was a little bit of big news here, SEC related. Bo Nix has made his decision here on Sunday night. The former Auburn Tiger, I know Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin was trying to get in there, but he's going to the Pac-12. The team he beat his first appearance as an Auburn Tiger, he's transferring to Oregon Ducks to play for Dan Lanning, the uh of course, former Georgia defensive coordinator, now the new head coach at Oregon. And that's not the connection, though. The connection is Oregon hired offensive coordinator Kenny Dillingham. He was Bo Nix's quarterback coach and offensive coordinator there at one point at Auburn. So makes a little sense on paper. Do you know who Oregon opens the season with next season? If you don't, it's a familiar foe for Bo Nix at the Auburn Tigers. It's them Georgia Bulldogs in Atlanta. So as long as Bo Nix wins a starting quarterback job there in Oregon, he is going to be facing Kirby Smart's defense once again. So, man, he can't escape the SEC just yet, no matter where you go, Bo. So I just thought that was hilarious. But, uh, hey, at least we know where Bo Nix will be playing his college football next season. He's got two seasons of eligibility remaining if he wants it in Eugene. And then uh, – how about this? Speaking of quarterbacks, South Carolina lands four-star quarterback Tanner Bailey, who, ironically enough, was committed to Oregon under Mario Cristobal. Number 14 quarterback prospect in the country, a top 250 overall player in the 2022 class, over 6,000 yards and over 70 touchdowns the last three seasons in high school. So Tanner Bailey, another, all of a sudden, hey, South Carolina, Getting another quarterback arm is going to be eligible next season. Of course, it would be pretty stunning if he beat out Spencer Rattler, a true freshman, but 
hey, again, you'd rather have more talented arms in that room than not enough. And Shane Beamer and that staff had just added another talented quarterback after uh, having Jason Brown leave the program. We need Zeb Nolan, of course, uh, is going to be out of eligibility. Luke Doty, we'll see. Uh, you know, he's scheduled to come back. We'll see if that happens. But going to need some uh, insurance policy there in Columbia. And Shane Beamer and them got a hell of a quarterback to join the fold. Last thing I wanted to hit on here, Florida Gators. I just thought this was fantastic. They hired in a new assistant AD of recruiting strategy by the name of Katie Turner. She worked with Billy Napier at Louisiana. And if you haven't seen it by now, I'll throw it up on the YouTube here. She trolled Dan Mullen as soon as she got hired. Here's a tweet she sent out. The, her hire was announced there in Gainesville. Gator Nation, I am so excited to get to work. I promise recruiting time is never out of season. Now let's go have some fun. So, hey, she's having some fun there. Day one on the job with Billy Napier and the Florida Gators poking fun at old Dan Mullen. And uh, last thing here, speaking of uh, the Florida Gators, this comes courtesy of Chris Lowe. A lot of chatter that uh, Tosh Lapoy, Jaguars defensive line coach, was going to come to Gainesville, work for Billy Napier and company. But Chris Lowe says that will not be happening. So the Gators are going to have to look elsewhere for their defensive line coach. But hey, all right, so those are the news and notes I have here that happened. Pretty light weekend here overall in the SEC. That's why we loaded up on these interviews and why I really wanted to uh, you know, get some more inside, in-depth information on some of these teams, particularly after the early signing period. So we're going to start things off with Keith Allsap, host of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I think uh, South Carolina fans, of course, in particular, really going to enjoy this one. Hey, well, we're pleased to once again be joined by Keith Alsep, the outstanding host of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Got to give him a follow at K Alsep on the Twitter machine. He's the go-to source here for South Carolina Gamecock podcast updates. Keith, I really appreciate you joining the show once again. Hey, always happy to jump on with you. Happy holidays and uh, more officially, Merry Christmas. To everybody listening, it's uh, it was Christmas for for South Carolina football early this week, uh, <laughs> as well as for Texas A and M and Alabama and Georgia and you know a lot of other schools around the country, and it's getting ready to be bowl season. Yeah, without a doubt, and you know the Gamecocks really they started the party a little early uh, because on Monday evening they sent the social media a buzz with the addition of former Oklahoma quarterback Spencer Rattler and former Oklahoma tight end Austin Stogner. But let me ask you about Rattler first, because we all focus on the quarterback. We give him too much praise and too much blame, but how big is this for Shane Beamer and his uh, South Carolina program that, I mean, my God, they went from starting a coach, <laughs> starting an FCS quarterback to Maybe, uh, you know, a, a first round NFL draft pick here in a couple of years with Spencer Rattler. So just how big is this for the Gamecocks? Well, Michael, I just think it's astronomically big for Shane Beamer. I mean, if you go back to early September, he was the Heisman front runner. He was coming off a season at Oklahoma, which he threw for 3000 yards, 28 touchdowns, seven interceptions led them to the big 12. Uh, championship and you know they boat raced uh old Danny Kicks uh quitters <laughs> down there in uh, Gainesville in the bowl game mm -hmm. and uh you know he was the Heisman favorite coming into the season I mean he still completed over a 70 almost almost 75 percent of his passes for 1400 yards 11 touchdowns and five interceptions and you know, he got benched and, uh, you know, South Carolina was really pursuing Max Johnson and his brother, Jake Johnson, but Beamer had the relationship with Austin Stogner, who was an NFL tight end. Let's don't let him get lost in this. But I think getting a guy like Spencer Rattler, right? Like he's not coming to South Carolina to win six games next year. I think he gives you instant credibility in the transfer portal to be able to attract a couple of big time wide receivers that 
you know, no offense to Jason Brown or Luke Doty, uh, it's just not the same buzz as having a chance to come in and catch passes from a guy like that. Yeah, and that's how I try to, you know, I've been kind of breaking it down. I've seen, you know, plenty of criticism. This guy, you know, he got, got benched at Oklahoma, didn't work out for whatever reason. Uh, but, you know, that's not the story to me. The story is you have just monumentally upgraded at the game's most important position, and you did it overnight. He's going to be in there for spring. He's going to be in there, obviously, for fall. They'll be good to go with, uh, you know, that was the hottest topic all offseason. Who's South Carolina going to have a quarterback? We got some talented guys, but they never played. This is a guy that you said is a championship uh, quarterback, led his team to the Big 12 championship. He faced SEC defenses. He knows what it's about. And I think that's how you got to judge it. You got to judge it by what you had, not uh, not necessarily what went wrong. And I can't think of any way this is bad for South Carolina. And, and I think this legitimately, probably my favorite thing, you know, in years past, a guy like Shane Beamer, you'd have to say, well, you know, we can't judge him until year three, year four, till we see him he's get his players in there and they're more mature. Now with the transfer portal, this is the beauty of it. You automatically upgrade to a guy that right now, I know they got a, almost a year to get him ready, but if they were going to go take the field tomorrow, they got confidence in their signal caller and they just didn't have that all of last year, which, I, which is just huge. Yeah, I mean, you've got an accomplished guy who does not lack for confidence. Okay, I think he got humbled this season, from my understanding. Uh, even in the portal, you know, that was a little bit of a humbling experience. I think he, you know, maybe he did want to go back closer to home, and all of a sudden, Arizona State's quarterback decides I'm coming back, and UCLA, you know, takes Gabriel from UCF, which. I mean, that guy's a good fit for Chip, Chip Kelly. Mm -hmm. But I think this gives South Carolina's offense, which, by the way, finished 116th in the country, okay, a much-needed uh, shot in the arm. And, you know, it set the program with a lot of buzz. You know, speaking to sources inside the program, their phones were blowing up, you know, with 2023 recruits. Guys in the portal instantly being drawn now more to South Carolina because that's just a game changer. I mean, I, I joked on my podcast that, you know, if, if you kind of felt the ground moving in the Carolinas and Georgia and Tennessee and Florida, that was a seismic shift in the SEC East because I don't think anybody has a quarterback like Spencer Rattler coming back in the SEC East. I mean, Florida – I mean, Billy Napier's got a big rebuild, partly out of his own choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like Anthony Richardson, and certainly you got to like Hendon Hooker coming back at Tennessee. But Spencer Rattler, you know, statistically and on paper, is probably the top quarterback in the SEC East. And I think he's going to be a huge draw for South Carolina in the transfer portal over the next six months. Now – they may not be done adding Oklahoma players. That's what I really wanted to ask you about because all I hear from Gamecock fans right now is uh, this guy. I hope I'm saying his name right, Theo Weiss, the uh, the former five-star. He's been at uh, Oklahoma. He's in the portal now, 530 yards receiving, four touchdowns last season. You hearing anything that uh, the Gamecocks maybe have any buzz with him now that they've added two of his former teammates? I mean, you hear a lot of things, and and Weiss was in the portal, but I think his family situation uh, is going to lend to him staying closer to home. And look, why wouldn't you just now that you know you got Brent Venables, but more importantly, you got Jeff Lebby. Okay, why wouldn't you want to catch passes from Caleb Williams in his offense mm -hmm. next year? And so I'm kind of expecting him to stay at. Oklahoma. Uh, but I do think that, you know, there certainly are going to be a lot more guys in the portal after bowl games. Uh, there is going to be frantic probably from, you know, January 2nd 
until guys can enroll for that spring semester, whenever that is in January for your school. And then there'll be more guys in the portal that you can bring in in the summertime. So I think, you know, buckle up really for everybody because this transfer portal thing is changing college football. That's why you're not going to get four or five years now. Mm -hmm. You're going to get two, maybe three seasons at the most. And if you hadn't turned it, they're getting somebody else because the transfer portal has really changed the game. Now, I apologize if I missed it. I, was, I just got back from vacation, as you know, but uh, Josh Van, is he coming back? And, and does uh, Spencer Rattler, I got to assume with getting him, now all of a sudden uh, I mean, South Carolina coming back is a lot more attractive to Josh Van. All indications are Josh Van is coming back next year. I also think in the spring you'll see Jaheim Bell transition to being a full-time wide receiver uh, that gives you two guys uh amari and brown i thought was completely underutilized at south carolina you've got xavier leggett who made a couple of big catches uh this year omega blake is a very talented kid as a former high school quarterback and defensive back and wide receiver that they redshirted Outside of those guys, though, I think it's wide open at wide receiver. Uh, Landon Sampson is a signee who's coming in from Dallas South Lake Carroll, who's a very polished receiver, 6'1", 180 pounds, legitimate, sub-4.5 speed. And a guy with really good hands, he's an in early enrollee. I think he's got a chance to really come in and help the program. Uh, but then I think you know, South Carolina only signed one other wide receiver who plays eight-man football and is very raw, mm -hmm. high upside, but probably not ready to play. And I think you're really going to see South Carolina focus on trying to bring in at least two portal wide receivers. Now, the other big question there in Columbia that I'm getting peppered with, and I thought this guy was as good as gone, but it's been a while. Uh, we just had the recruiting cycle, obviously, and now we've got uh, – we just added a quarterback and a tight end, and I got a figure that Marcus Satterfield was big – heavily involved in that. I mean, you're not going to – you're not going to get a quarterback without the uh, coordinator, you know, meeting with him and talking about the offense. So uh, do you expect at this point Marcus Satterfield to return and, and maybe even Greg Atkins? Let me ask you that. Either one coming or going, and, you know, is it, really, is it fair to judge Satterfield given the fact that uh, – you know, the quarterback play was was not that great and the offensive line play not that great. I don't care if you had Joe Brady last year. If you don't got a quarterback, you don't have an offensive line and you're lacking receivers. I mean, I've hit all the boxes here. Uh, it's tough to grade an offensive coordinator, in my opinion, based on all, all the issues that South Carolina had. I mean, there certainly were issues, but Mike, South Carolina returned four starters uh, and two other guys who had started some games. Uh, off an offensive line where Kevin Harris led the SEC in rushing. Uh, I think the scheme was completely different and very complex. Uh, Greg Atkins has is, is, uh, had some health issues. He's had some personal family issues. And I just have to think with Spencer Rattler coming in, I mean, Shane Beamer was asked that question Uh on Wednesday during his national signing day press conference. And I thought he totally deflected and didn't mention Marcus Satterfield's name one time. Hmm. I mean, he's playing this thing very close to the vest. I personally think that Marcus Satterfield will probably look to move back to the NFL. I think Greg Atkins, you know, may not be healthy enough uh, to return to full-time coaching. And so I do expect after the bowl game uh, for Shane Beamer to make a couple of changes on that offensive staff. Hmm, interesting. Now, we've got to hit on the, the class here. Very interesting class. I know they've got several more spots to fill, but, you know, we're talking went heavy on defense, defensive backs, linebackers, defensive linemen. Those are their, the key positions they filled. Yet on offense, like you said, they only added a couple receivers a couple offensive linemen and a quarterback. So you kind of already hit on the receivers. 
Is there any other position or position or two that you'd really like to see the Gamecocks add, either via uh, the high school recruiting or via the transfer portal heading into the spring? I think, you know, offensive tackles, when they go in the transfer portal, those guys are like seven footers were 20 years ago, right? <laughs> like, you know, if, if South Carolina is going to recruit them, so is Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Southern Cal, Penn State, Ohio State, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Clemson, I, I think it's going to be difficult. I do think they would like to add an offensive tackle that could come in and play. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Kevin Harris is probably going to the NFL along with Zaquandre White after the bowl game. So I think South Carolina would probably look at a portal running back. And then I still think they would take uh, an edge rusher, a linebacker, or, you know, they're not going to turn down a great player at any position uh, that's experienced. Uh, so... I think those are, are really the key positions for me would be linebacker, inside linebacker, edge rusher, uh, running back, uh, wide receiver. I think those are really the positions. And quite frankly, if you could find another really good high school quarterback out there because Jason Brown is leaving, Luke Doty's got a foot injury, Mm -hmm. uh, Braden Davis, a kid that they did sign out of Delaware, the son of uh, Anton Davis, a guy I'm sure you probably know well from his days at Tennessee. Oh, yeah. Um, he's much more of a developmental guy. High upside, but raw, 6'5", 195. Going to be really good, but he's probably not going to be ready to help you for a couple of years. So I think, you know, the expectation, Spencer Rattler's probably thinking, hey, I want to go to South Carolina, light it up, and be a first-round pick uh, in the 2022, nope, 2023 NFL draft. <laughs> yeah. Now, let me let me ask you because this was a bit this was a big topic not only in Columbia obviously but uh, in the SEC during the early the first day of the early signing period. But what do you make of this day of Jay Shaw Barhab drama where? If you missed the story, he committed to South Carolina, I believe, on a Saturday. And then here on Wednesday on the signing day, uh, does a 180, goes to Maryland. And then Shane Beamer, to his credit, comes out and says, I got tipped off this was going to happen. And, and I, you know, it was pretty wild. And then Barham's here trolling South Carolina and, and Maryland's putting out the video content. What would you make of all that, uh, all that shenanigans? Can I say a four-letter word on your show? Absolutely. Totally uncensored here. It was a total shit show. <laughs> yeah. And I really feel bad for the kid because clearly the adults in his life, you know, if that was the case and they were still, the parents, the family were still telling Shane Beamer at 11 p.m. on the night before signing day, he was coming to South Carolina and evidently this whole thing was orchestrated. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel bad for the kid because... You know, he's 17 years old. Uh, do kids change their mind? Sure. But if this whole thing's been orchestrated from the beginning, and then Mike Loxley, everybody knows that guy's a ruthless recruiter, but I just have no respect left for him. Uh, just the public trolling, the videos, the tweets. I just thought it was like summer vacation. No class. <laughs> Yet at the end of the day, I mean, you may be losing a talented kid, but, uh, you know, I think Beamer danced around this, but I'll just say it. I mean, I think you're better off without this type of character into your program, even if I don't care if he's a five star. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if it helps you, you know. Uh, but speaking of the, the ones that South Carolina actually got, if you had to pinpoint one or two signees that you think will make the biggest impact next season, uh, aside from obviously the, the transfer from Oklahoma, uh, who do you think that player or players will be for the Gamecocks? Well, I think I'm going to go down to uh, Miami Central High School. Anthony Rose is a kid. He was actually the first commitment to South Carolina way back in, 
I think February or March uh, of this year. Then he decommitted. Then he came to summer camp and just fell in love with the place. His family came up and he wound up committing again. He's 6'3 or 6'4, 190 pounds. He's sub 4'5 in the 40s. Got long arms. He's one of those South Florida DBs that's got the swagger. I think he can make an immediate impact. He's an early enrollee. And then I think Landon Sampson from Dallas South Lake Carroll, simply because it is a position of need. And he's got such a high ceiling playing at a big time high school program for Riley Dodge, who was a receiver for Mike Leach at Texas tech. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he's, you know, you just add water and stir and he's ready to go. I think the most in two intriguing guys, one is an early enrollee named DeAndre Martin from Durham, North Carolina. He flipped from Virginia Tech. He's 6'5", 290 pounds. But three years ago or two years ago, he was a 6'3", 210-pound wide receiver. And uh, he came into the last day of summer camp. They had the O-line, D-line camp at the end of July. And nobody knew who this guy was. And he had only been playing defensive line for about a month. And he's just a freakish type of athlete. And I think down the road, he's really intriguing to me. And then a guy locally out of Irmo named Nick Eamon Worry, 6'3 and a half, 210 pounds, safety, linebacker, cornerback. Uh, a tackling machine had over 230 tackles as a senior in high school. A lot of comparisons to him in high school to Isaiah Simmons, simply because they're about the same size. They both could do it all. And he could be a positionless guy because Shane Beamer said they got three coaches that are fighting over him. Torian Gray in the <laughs> secondary, Clayton White at linebacker, and even Mike Peterson uh, as the – you know, outside linebackers, uh, Bucks coach. Mm -hmm. All right, great stuff, Keith. One final question for you. I really appreciate all your time. We still got a bowl game here, and it's the Duke's Mayo Bowl against North Carolina. That's a a, a series that uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, they've been going back and forth for several years here. The game's on uh, Thursday, December 30th. I believe the Tar Heels currently a, a seven-point favorite. What are your thoughts on this matchup? And, uh, you know, can the Gamecocks pull a surprise here and, and, and pull off the upset? Well, I mean, you just never know in bowl games. I mean, I'll say this. You know, it hurts South Carolina that J.J. Enigbare has opted out. Mm -hmm. It hurts that Zaquandre White opted out. I thought he was the offensive MVP of the team. And then Jason Brown kind of got his feelings hurt when Spencer Rattler transferred in. He's – in the transfer portal. And so Sam Howell, who's going to be a first round pick, he's not opting out of the right. bowl game. You know, North Carolina, you know, I, I would have never imagined Mac Brown could outdoor and Dave Doran in that North Carolina <laughs> NC state game. <laughs> I mean, they blew a 30 to 21 lead with two minutes and 12 seconds to go in that game. And uh, so that's kind of bizarre. Uh, I think, you know, North Carolina is the favorite, but again, in bowl games, I would have never imagined back in 2000, South Carolina would have, you know, beaten the pants off Ohio State, but they wanted to be there and Ohio State really didn't. And so mm -hmm. I think it, you know, that's going to have a lot to do with it. Uh, but it's going to be an uphill battle for South Carolina facing Sam Howell and that offense, which I believe can put up a lot of points because let's face it outside of, you know, playing the Florida quitters this year, uh, they didn't put up a lot of points against anybody. <laughs> well, if it helps, I, I believe Shane Beamer's already come out and said, well, they want to dump the Mayo on me. I'll 
for a win, I'll do it. So, hey, maybe that'll inspire them Gamecocks to, to get up for this game and, and have some fun there in the Duke's Mayo Bowl. But, hey, I really do appreciate you, Keith. Keith Alsap, give him a follow at K Alsap on the Twitter machine, host of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Keith, I really appreciate you uh, joining me and, and dropping so much knowledge here for the audience. Man, I really appreciate you. I mean, Michael, you're the dean of SEC podcasting. <laughs> Everybody knows you're the go-to guy, and uh, it's just an honor. So, uh, Merry Christmas to you, and uh, is it Cousin Shane? Is that right? Yes, sir. Yep. Mer Merry <laughs> Christmas to you guys, and uh, well, I just can't say go Vols, but... <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate the sentiment. But, uh, hey, Merry Christmas to you too, buddy. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Absolutely. Anytime, Michael. Merry Christmas to you and uh, all the good folks that listen to that SEC podcast. All right. Just want to say thanks to my man, Keith, for joining the show, providing some insight there. Uh, Keith's been on the show a number of times. I've been on his show a number of times. He does an outstanding job. If you're not already listening to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. Cannot recommend it enough. He has multiple guests each week. He does a heck of a job covering the South Carolina Gamecocks. So really appreciative of Keith for joining the show. But hey, let's get on to our second interview of the podcast. We got Matthew Ray of Sports Illustrated and SI All-American covers the Tennessee Vols. And pretty much anytime I see a Tennessee in the race for a recruit, maybe like an edit or a, a finalist or cutting down his list. They always tag Matt in their post. They, because he's one of their guys that, that he's constantly digging for information. Go find all of Matt's work there at Sports Illustrated. If you're not already, we're going to go on a deep dive here of Tennessee's signing class and preview the upcoming Music City Bowl against Purdue. So let's kick it over to our interview. All right, well, we're pleased now to be joined by Matt Ray, who works for Sports Illustrated, covering Tennessee and Tennessee recruiting for the SI All-American. You can give him a follow at Matt Ray SI. Matt, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hey, Mike, I'm glad to be with you. I appreciate the invite and excited to talk with you here. Yeah, so, you know, the reason I reached out to you, because I've been following you for a long time, and you really are one of the best out there covering Tennessee and Tennessee recruiting. Uh, I mean, you're all over it. Uh, it seems like anytime there's a commitment or a decommitment or an update, uh, these players are tagging you on their, uh, on their stories there. So uh, I really appreciate you taking some time. And, uh, you know, that's what we're going to focus on with just the, the early signing period just happened, of course. And uh, so I just really wanted to get your thoughts on the, the overall job that Josh Heupel and his coaching staff did with this recruiting class given the fact that, uh, you know, for most of their tenure, they've had to, uh, potential NCAA issues looming over them, yet here we sit and they've got uh, a consensus top 20 class. Uh, what are your thoughts on on this signing class by Tennessee? Yeah, I think first and foremost, just the ability for Josh Heupel to come in behind on so many guys in state that were looking to push towards a decision early on and having to try to build those relationships initially, see who he could make a push for and and then try to, you know, get a staff in around him, readjust and, and rebuild a recruiting board was just a tremendous task right away. Um, and, and some of those in-state guys did not want to slow down and commit or even take another look at Tennessee for that matter. And that makes it hard because Josh Hoppel talked about recruiting the in-state and wanting to, you know, build a border around Tennessee more or less. But for what he was able to do in year one by getting a guy like Elijah Harry and Cameron Miller in early, two guys that are greatly respected by their peers in state, both play on the Tennessee Select 7-on-7, seven seven, which we see every single year have the best players in the state of Tennessee on it during that 7-on-7 seven seven circuit. You know, get those two guys in to lay a little bit of a foundation moving forward into 2023. Um, that, that was a really good start for him, I felt like. Then you talk to guys over the summer when official visits finally open back up, they can get to campus. 
and there was hesitation, like you said, over that looming investigation. I think Tennessee did some things really well there. They had, um, you know, player recruit meetings where they kind of had players come in and, and do a panel where recruits could ask questions, uh, get answers about what the new coaching staff was like, what they had seen from the previous coaching staff. Was the culture really changing what these coaches said? And, and Tennessee's coaches left the room and, and let it be amongst the players. And there was a lot of genuine conversation had there. And I think that led to some of that early success you saw in June carrying forward into August, into the Addison Nichols commitment there. But then – it kind of slowed down for Tennessee. Everybody kind of started to wonder, well, where is this going with Josh Heupel? They're in on a handful of guys, but where's the traction at? And, and quietly behind the team, behind the scenes, Tennessee worked, 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 and were able to win some big time recruiting battles. I mean, Josh started with Joshua Josephs, uh, the edge from North Cobb, a guy that this staff believes has tremendous potential, can be a first-round guy for them off the edge as he continues to develop into his frame. And when they started getting those commitments, it started to carry over. They didn't have a lot of trouble holding on to some of their other commitments. And then they finished on signing day with Justin Williams, James Pierce, and Tyree West. That's three big recruiting wins in – you know, hotbed areas in South Georgia, Atlanta, and Charlotte that Tennessee needed to to make inroads into. And I don't think a lot of people would have expected Josh Hopple and company to be able to do that in year one. Now, overall, I think it was a very good signing class from top to bottom for Tennessee. I think they got faster at the skill. I think they got stronger and longer uh, at the in the defensive backfield, I think they added some athleticism up front and they added a couple of running backs that are dynamic uh, to go along with Taven Jackson and those four receivers that can really do a lot of things uh, in this offense. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, West there, Tyree West, the four-star defensive lineman they signed, Justin Williams, the uh, four-star running back, and James Pierce, uh, the guy out of North Carolina you mentioned there that is a, a four-star pass rusher. You know, how important were those pickups for the Tennessee Vols during the first day of of the early signing period to to really push this team up the uh, class rankings? Yeah, those, those were big pickups. So you look, start with Justin Williams. He got the news going early on, and uh, I enjoyed Justin's recruitment. Worked, worked a lot with Justin. He worked a lot with me. And, you know, he didn't tell a staff – coming into that decision which way he was going. He he official he officially visited Tennessee the weekend before, um, talked to him after that, but he he was not going to tell a staff. He was going to leave at least a little bit of speculation out there on where he was going. And and he and he enjoyed that part of the process. But that was a big win for Tennessee. That was a guy that can do a lot of things in their backfield, high IQ on and off the field. Uh, greater than a 4.0 GPA at East Paulding, a third in his class, pushing, you know, to, in the valedictorian, salutatorian range there. So just a guy that's well-rounded in, in all facets that Tennessee's really excited to have. And I think when you look at this, the part of the state that Justin Williams lives in, in Georgia, that's a, you know, that's a normal recruiting ground for Auburn. You've got Cadillac Williams in. He he really liked Auburn. He had waited for that Auburn offer for a long time, had heard from that staff consistently, but they chose to slow play him a little bit. And ultimately, when Tennessee offered, they never relented. And, and credit Jerry Mack there for being able to push Tennessee to the finish line with Justin Williams because he he had kind of made his mind up uh, coming out of a couple of back-to-back -back visits there that Tennessee was the place for him, his family. The staff spent time with him you know, before the game, after the game, I was come over, spoke to him at halftime of the game that they really impressed him the most on. That stood out to him and his family. Um, but when Auburn offered, it, it definitely gave him something to think about. He'd been waiting for that for a while. So anytime that you can go into that area, beat out Auburn for a running back target that they want, that, that's a big win in my opinion. Uh, so, you know, again, credit to Jerry Mack there. And then Tyree West was next. And, and I think it, I think for Tennessee fans, they they got something that they had been hoping for from the start of this recruiting class, they wanted a high-profile defensive lineman. They wanted Rodney. They wanted that Rodney Garner recruit, you know, and and that's what Tyree West was. Tennessee was, you know, they had continued communication with West for a while, but they hadn't been involved in that recruitment for a long time. 
Uh, and then Rodney Garner comes in late. Florida State seemingly has all of the momentum because West was not going to end up in Georgia's class um, on on signing day regardless. Um, Florida State had all the momentum, had a lot of ties um, to him in South Georgia, and, and Rodney Garner gets him up on the final weekend and is able to steal that momentum and, and get the signature across another big win for Tennessee. He's a guy who I think has a lot of potential as a pass rusher can continue to develop in his frame, probably needs to add uh, uh, some good weight, uh, but from inside out standpoint with his athleticism, he's definitely going to help this Tennessee defensive line, a guy that this staff is excited about. Um, and then James Pierce, a longtime target, a guy that just really hasn't said a lot on the recruiting front in general. Didn't didn't take an official visit to Tennessee. Really didn't take an official visit to any of his final contenders with Georgia and Ole Miss being the primary competition there down the stretch. But you know, credit Mike Equiter in this one out to Charlotte multiple times during the contact period when you know when they could see him. Uh, the Tennessee staff was out to Charlotte within the contact period um, to see him continued to recruit him all the way up to the finish and was able to get him to sign during the early signing period. Another guy that just from hearing this staff talk and, and talk behind the scenes, they feel like is a freakish pass rusher because of how he can bend, how he moves, and what he can do from a backside pursuit approach. Just t elite top end speed for his six foot five, 220 pound frame. Um, and, and an area that Tennessee needed to get back into. It's an area that when you look at Jeremy Pruitt's tenure, they fought very hard to get back into. They were able to land Quavaris Crouch out of Charlotte um, mm -hmm. in, in that first full recruiting cycle. But they really fought to get back in that area and didn't win a lot of those battles. But Tennessee picked James Pierce's their battle there this year, was able to win that. Th just three big signatures, I think, for Tennessee in terms of, guys that are immediate impact players. I think each year at signing day, you can look and see guys in each class. Yeah, maybe you landed them early, but I think in most classes, you'll see a guy or two that you sign that has that early impact potential. And I think for Tennessee, Williams and Pierce both have it. And we'll see how um, early enrolling helps Tyree West in terms of filling out his frame. And if he can, you know, feel like his friend get the body SEC ready. But from an athleticism standpoint, he could help Tennessee early on as well. Now, you mentioned the in-state recruiting. Obviously, the, the Vols like the two players they signed from uh, inside the, the borders there. But, you know, considering there's several five stars in state and they're, they're all playing in the SEC and none of them playing at, at Tennessee now, you know, I think that's the, the one gripe I, Tennessee fans can have with this class. What's your confidence level that uh, Josh Heupel and company will be able to, um, you know, recruit the state of Tennessee a little bit better? And why do you think uh, – was it just so much that, that a lot of these guys wanted to, to recruit early and, and uh, they were – it was just – would have been incredibly difficult for Tennessee to, to win a, a lot of these recruiting battles given the timelines for some of these decisions? Yeah, you know, I think when you – I think when you look in state, I think you start with Ty Simpson, obviously the five-star quarterback, uh, highest rated uh, quarterback in the, I, mean, I guess, the modern day recruiting with five, with, with star rankings. Um, it started with him and he had just announced, you know, his decision timeline uh, around the time that all of the shuffle went on with Jeremy Pruitt and being fired, Josh Heupel coming in. Um, and Tennessee did a good job of, you know, getting Ty Simpson on the phone, communicating with him, trying to make a push. Um, but it, it just wasn't enough. Ultimately, at the end of the day, he, he chose to decide between Alabama and Clemson, and he didn't slow down. And, and I think for me, that's a big reason that Tennessee had a little bit of a harder time in state this year. Um, that was the initial guy that kind of, you know, broke the mold, went outside the state, and then – he very well respected among his peers. Another guy, like I said, that, that Tennessee Select seven on seven team is is one of the premier teams nationally. They go across the country and compete. He's the quarterback of that team. He had a good relationship with Dallin Hayden, had a good relationship with a lot of those guys on there that you saw slip out of state um, and and make, you know, decisions to go elsewhere. Um, Tennessee they recruited the Wade twins. 
Um, but that ultimately didn't come to the finish line. I don't think Tennessee felt that they wanted Destin Wade as a quarterback. And ultimately, when you look at what he has done in his career as a quarterback at Summit High School, 15-0 and last year, went 14-1 and this year, he felt like he had a right to be a quarterback. And Kentucky recruited him as a quarterback, and those two guys were a package deal. Uh, so that, that makes it hard to overcome. But, yeah, Tennessee lost some, you know, tough – Tough guys, uh, some some great players in state this year and tough recruiting battles. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think Tennessee did enough in state with the way that they handled the contact period, the way that they were able to get guys in and show them that, you know, they're going to be a priority moving forward. This isn't just talk. Um, and, and I think Tennessee will ultimately be able to recruit the state better in the coming years. And I think, again, going back to Elijah Herring, um, I think it starts in 2023 with his brother, Caleb, right now. Wherever you look, he's the top player in the state. Uh, obviously, that's a very close-knit family. Uh, and anytime you have a recruit like uh, Elijah committed, if you go in home with him, you know, by um, – it's kind of, I guess, grandfathered in is – you can still <laughs> – actually talk to a younger recruit because you're you're in home with them so there's no uh no way the NCAA can you know really penalize you for that so Tennessee had a chance to go in home with Elijah Herring Caleb Harry uh is obviously there to see the conversation hear the conversation Tennessee staff able to communicate with him he comes out for the visits with his brother you have to imagine he'll come out to move in day with his brother so all those opportunities for Tennessee to start with the guy to get a good jump start with a guy that's going to be the big fish in 2023 I think it's very important for me uh, mm -hmm. I think I think that's going to be the guy to watch in terms of how Tennessee fares in 2023 in state and again Tennessee's only improving from top to bottom uh, in state uh, in in terms of how much true top end talent they are producing. You know, in years past, we've seen some guys, you know, be ranked as a four star, but maybe they don't end up at a school that suggests that they were, you know. But I think that at the end of the day, Tennessee from top to bottom in the Nashville area, in the Memphis area, are continuing to grow and uh, produce more top, more true top end talent. Uh, obviously, you know, I think the battle that everybody focused on for months was Walter Nolan. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can't, you can't really touch on in-state recruiting without touching on Walter Nolan. Uh, obviously he was a national recruit when he came to Powell high school and had been for some time. He had been at all the branch in Mississippi, which is a football factory. He had been to IMG over the summer, came back to St. Benedict at Auburndale and then to Powell. So he had been all over the country and had seen, you know, a lot of different schools. But I mean, that, again, that was just a heavyweight recruiting battle. Uh, I, I was involved in that recruitment for a while in terms of following. And I was the, you know, the point person at SI for the longest time there. And Tennessee got really, really close on Walter Nolan a couple of times. And that family pulled back, geared back, and wanted to, you know, see all the options out there. And at the end of the day, they felt like Texas A&M was the best fit for them. But in September, when we started filming um, Walter's commitment video with him, he he was really down to four schools at the time. It was Florida, Georgia, Texas A&M, and Tennessee. And we started on a Thursday night. And coming into Sunday, it looked like the Vols were – he was going to pull the trigger to the Vols by some point on midday on Sunday, uh, but then that never came to fruition. They slowed that, slowed things back down, and Tennessee had momentum a time or two. It felt like Florida grabbed momentum back at one point, but ultimately Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M were able to win out. So, I mean, a, a true roller coaster recruitment uh, for Walter Nolan there. If you had to uh, highlight one signee, maybe two, that you think will make the biggest impact for Tennessee on the field – next season uh who's that guy for you i'm gonna i'm gonna take james pierce and desmond williams i i, I think justin williams is going to get a, a handful of touches next year too i think he'll see his work i think he'll see a decent workload next year as well but for me it'd be james pierce and desmond williams again i've already touched on pierce just what he can do um from a, just a true athleticism standpoint on that edge 
uh, able to drop into coverage, able to do so many things. I think Tennessee will find a way to get him onto the field, especially in pass rush situations. And then Tennessee needed to add an impact corner and with Elante Taylor leaving and the mm-hmm. secondary going to going to shuffle around. And I think Desmond Williams, a guy that has you know really good ball skills, has a nose for being around the football. And I think he's a guy that can step in there and compete right away at one of the corner spots, whether that is playing in a nickel. He's a, he's a little bit of a smaller guy at, at 5'11", you know, 185, 190. But maybe he plays in over the nickel and that allows you know, someone else to kick out to the edge or if he's on the edge even. But I think, I think he's a guy that gives Tennessee a lot of options now in the, in the defensive secondary. I think he'll make an impact and see plenty of playing time for Tennessee as well. Is there a position group that uh, you, th- you think Tennessee still needs to address, whether it's in the, uh, you know, the traditional s- signing period here in, in February, National Signing Day, or via the transfer portal uh, before next season rolls around? Is there, is there one position group that stands out? I think still the defensive line is probably the position group that stands out. I think you got two athletic guys in Tyree West and Jordan Phillips, but they're true freshmen, and you don't you don't want to go into an SEC schedule in year two in a season that you can make a big jump relying on, you know, two true freshmen to have to make plays for you down the stretch. I think Tennessee would like to probably find a veteran guy there again in the transfer portal. Maybe they move some guys around uh, on their defensive front. You know, you could see a guy like maybe Tyler Barron shifting more inside into a different technique other than that stand-up edge roll if he's able to add a little bit of weight. But I think the defensive line civil position that Tennessee probably will try to address in the transfer portal if the right guy's out there. They're recruiting Ahmad Moten out of uh, Cardinal Gibbons in South Florida. But again, he's a 2022 guy, and, and he looks like he has a tremendous amount of upside, but also needs to be developed in terms of, of making an impact at an SEC level. So he's the guy that Tennessee's going to push for, but a lot of other schools are going to push for. And then they're obviously involved with Jared first the Albany transfer who Mm -hmm. I believe probably has every offer in the country right now it seems like (laughs) I mean uh talked with him after his Tennessee visit he had taken I think five or six visits in in a seven day span and in the three or four days leading up to that he's only been in the transfer portal roughly 10 days he um he had um four or five different coaches out to see him so he's a guy that You know, when I talked to him, he wanted to slow things down, try to make a decision by Christmas. Well, now he's had six more offers come in since that final day that he visited Tennessee right before the contact period closed. So he's trying – he didn't have a recruitment the first time around. You know, he Mm -hmm. signed with Albany, and that was was it. And he's trying to enjoy – the recruiting process he's he's trying I'm not gonna say enjoy it but he's trying to at least experience it It, it's tough to enjoy it sometimes when it's like that you know with with coaches constantly calling but but he he's trying to experience the process he's trying to listen to what every school says even though he can't visit he's going to try to see you know virtual tours FaceTime with coaches and and continuing to receive offers USC Oklahoma Miami have all came in in recent days so he has a lot to weigh out but Tennessee got the last crack at him there with an we one of the longer visits that he was able to take came away impressed with what Rodney Garner had to offer so he's a guy that you know I think they could make a real push for in terms of bringing in as a transfer um, to solidify that that front and allow some flexibility to maybe move a guy like Tyler Barron or to maybe move somebody else, you know, to more of a a, a down lineman role. We'll see what happens there. But uh, I think defensive line for me is probably the position that Tennessee needs to add uh, in, in the late signing period. And then I think everybody else that you can find – is just a a bonus. I think they could, you know, target the secondary as well and probably add another body there, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I think there's still some decisions to be made on all fronts as they're continuing to evaluate every angle. I think the good thing for Tennessee is that with 20 signees and being able to hold on to all of the guys that they had committed and that they wanted in this class and to, you know, add those three pivotal pieces on signing day, it allows mm-hmm. them to kind of fresh start, reset, and 
you know, see where they really need to distribute their time. Because I think at last count, it's 12 or 13 of the early signees are going to be here, you know, for ball practice. So you don't really have to worry about these guys pretty soon. You're going to have them on campus and, and have them working with you. So Tennessee is going to be able to push forward and evaluate talent. And that's something that this staff, you know, feels strongly about is their ability to evaluate talent. So it's going to be interesting to see who they discover going into February. All right, Matt, last thing for you. I really appreciate all your time, but hey, we get all this thrown on us with the, with the coaching carousel and the recruiting, and then here we turn around. We got we still got bowl game to play, so I just <laughs> yeah. wanted to get your quick thoughts on the, the Music City Bowl matchup against Purdue. How does uh, Tennessee match up, and uh, do you think the Vols can get a win there? Yeah, that's I, I think that's a good matchup for Tennessee. Uh, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a good game overall, back and forth. I don't think this and I may be completely wrong, but I don't think this is going to be the typical, you know, SEC Big Ten ball where you see the SEC <laughs> run away from it. I think, I think Purdue, I think Purdue is a, a well-rounded team. Now they did lose, obviously, George Karloftis and David Bell, who will not play. And I think that's pretty significant when you look at what both of those guys have done in terms of production for them. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Karloftis has been just outstanding in his career at Purdue. He's going to be a first-round guy in April when the draft comes and then David Bell, I mean, his, I, he, he had almost more catches by himself than Tennessee's top three receivers combined. So he was the true number one there uh, and a guy that is accounts for a bulk of their offensive production. So that certainly is, is a hit to Purdue, but I think you, know, you give Jeff Brom some time to scheme. I think it'll be a chess match back and forth early between him and Josh Hoppel and, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be an exciting game. I do think Tennessee can win that ball, you know, win that ball game. Uh, at the end of the day, I think they have the offensive firepower, um, you know, not really suffering, you know, many opt outs right now, obviously waiting on, on Cade Mays' decision, you know, to see what he's going to do. But right now, Avante Taylor, the only opt out having been at practice this week, Tennessee uh, is relatively healthy. Um, you know, so I, I think, I think you should see Tennessee score some points against Purdue and, and, and a very good Purdue team. I think it's a good measuring stick for Tennessee going into next season. You know, they beat number two Iowa at the time. I want to say Michigan State was number three or four at the time that they beat them. So you know, have, they have some quality wins. So this is going to be a good test for Tennessee, but I do think Tennessee can win this ball game uh, if they can score some points early, which has been the trend under Josh Hobbler. What he's done in the first quarter has been, wow. <laughs> yeah without a doubt well hey so he's matt ray gotta give him a follow at matt ray si works for sports illustrated covering tennessee and tennessee recruiting for si all american matt thank you so much uh i really appreciate it yeah my guy enjoyed it anytime all right so just want to say thanks matt for joining the show once again give him a follow at matt ray si on the twitter machine really outstanding stuff really appreciate him First time he has been on the show, he was kind enough to do that. And, hey, last but not least, one of my guys there, one of my favorites in the SEC, Nate Edwards of Rock M Nation, does an outstanding job covering the Missouri Tigers with the Beyond the Box Score podcast and all the work he does at Rock M Nation, part of the uh, SB Nation banner. So let's kick it over to our interview with Nate Edwards. Have a little fun with my guy, uh, after Missouri signed a historically great class in Eli Drinkowitz's second season there as the uh, the leader of the program. Well, we're pleased to once again be joined by Nate Edwards, who does an outstanding job for Rock M Nation. He's an editor and writer over there, and you got to give him a follow on social media, Nate G. Edwards, and uh, he has the go-to Missouri podcast on Rock M Nation Network before the box score podcast nate thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate it i'm glad to be back this is what third third time i get to be on the show this is excellent yeah absolutely i mean i honestly that's kind of what we try to do here you know we try to pride ourselves on we try to hit on all the teams in the sec not the the two that are in the playoff or the one with the scandal <laughs> over here we try to hit on all 14 so i really do appreciate you you keep coming back i haven't scared you off yet not yet. Uh, we'll see how you do this time. 
<laughs> well, of course, I wanted to reach out to you because, uh, you know, we just had, I don't know if you're calling it National Signing Day these days or just the early signing period, but it really is, um, you know, the main recruiting time of the year. And, man, it was, while it was drama-free the, the day for Missouri for the most part, historically great class for the Missouri Tigers. And uh, that's kind of something that you hit on on the, the Before the Box Score podcast. Uh, now it sounds like you don't like the drama. Can you can you get into that and, and why it was uh, such a drama-free day for uh, Eli Drinkowitz and company? Yeah, I, when you think of recruiting day drama, signing day drama, the, you, you usually imagine – blue chippers or a guy that you really, really want who someone else is going after too. And you're like, Oh, maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. And it's just, it's, it's nerve wracking. And it always kind of feels like no matter what team you enjoy, if you have a drama filled day, it usually goes poorly. Like you're going to forget all the good ones that you got. You're going to think of the ones that got away. And frankly, I like drama free signing days. I want to know that the kids who committed to the school, are sticking to it. They're not entertaining any other offers. They've shut it down. They're saying, yes, this is where I'm going to go. No ifs, ands, or buts. I'm not entertaining anybody else. And just knowing that you can wake up and say, we've got 16 guys. We're, we're getting 16 guys faxing in their in, uh, NLIs, and then we're done. To me, that is a perfect recruiting day with no headaches, no stress pulling, and you just go, yep, we got our guys. Let's move on and let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. And on your show, you also, man, this is a great nugget here that I caught in Drinkowitz, two classes at Missouri. He signed more blue chip recruits than Missouri's previous five recruiting classes combined. So safe to say that Drinkowitz has embraced the fact that, uh, you know, recruiting rankings and, and all that, that really does matter on the field. Uh, when Drinkowitz got hired, I mean, I'm sure you see it, all these other SEC fans, look at this nerd. Uh, this is Stu from the office. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Could just did you foresee this coming? All this recruiting success under Eli Drinkwitz, and how impressed are you by it? I mean, you look at the staffs that he's been on. He he was on the Auburn staff as a GA when they got they got Cam Newton the bag. So okay, he's seen that. But it's Boise State, it's Arkansas State, it's NC State. Like these are good teams not really known for their recruiting acumen. Boise gets the overlooked California guys. Arkansas State gets the overlooked Texas guys. Like that's kind of how they made made their their recruiting base. And you know, at, at App State, this is one year. Like he, he inherited one recruiting class and barely put together another one. So like we were hiring the guy buying low as a younger coach a younger offensive minded coach. That's why we got him. There's a lot of energy around him, but it was like, okay, you, you, you break up with your ex and you, and you go with someone who's the complete opposite young offensive guy. He checked those boxes. What we didn't anticipate was his salesmanship, his not only energy about the program and his job, but the energy of, of getting kids to buy in. And that, that pitch man that we, that he's kind of turned into not only with, recruits but really harnessing the cats that are the you know the missouri booster core he has really been able to put all that together get them rowing in the same direction get the money for nli get the money for these kids and he has been able to sell this program unlike any of the coaches that we've had before now granted that's two that's gary pinkle and barry odom but this is this is what happens when you have energy and when you have youth and you want to have a savvy salesman he day of he put on billboards in Kansas City and St. Louis, he put the names and faces of the kids who who, who recruited, who, who committed to Mizzou, put them up that day. That's how you that's how you recruit. That's how you program pitch, and that's how you quote unquote lock down the borders and keep the talent in. It's it, we had no idea that he could do this. Like you said, he's just a short, chubby nerd, but like he's got that energy. He's got that 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 salesmanship, and that's been that's been a wonderful treasure to to find out as the as the years has gone gone on. Yeah, and I think one thing that's overlooked, uh, not just for Drinkowitz, but uh, you know every coach in the country, but particularly I'm I'm thinking of guys that are basically two recycle two recruiting classes in uh, the, the 2021 class. You know there was. You couldn't even meet with them. There was no visits. It was all Zoom. And then this one, which uh, is even better than his first class, I believe half the cap, the recruiting calendar was the same deal. You couldn't host mm. prospects. You couldn't meet with them. So, man, it's it's impressive when you sit here and think 
you know, he's basically had, I think, about half a year of uh, in-person contact, yet here he is with, uh, I believe, the SEC's number four recruiting class as it stands yeah. right now. So, I mean, that is terrific. And it, you know, the, the jewel of the class, of course, uh, everyone fired up about Luther Burden, got him to stay home. Uh, he had offers from every place in the country and, and really had to beat out Georgia to land the, the elite number one receiver in the country. Yeah, thoughts on Luther Burden, of course. I, I'm, you went on and on about it on your podcast, or, and why wouldn't you? Because he's, he's going to be your most dynamic playmaker potentially from day one there at Missouri. But in addition to him, you know, I'm not trying to slight the rest of the receiving core at Missouri, but I don't know if there's a true number one, at least at the elite SEC level on Missouri's roster. Now, if you potentially got that Luther Burden, to me, that upgrades your entire receiving core because you, you you got nice pieces. They're just, mm -hmm. like I said, you just don't have that dominant number one, which you you assume you're getting with Luther Burden. So what does his addition do to uh, that entire room and that entire offense? It, it, it makes everybody's job easier from the quarterback to especially the receivers. That is your number one. Um, every receiver on this roster currently has a skill, one specific skill. Uh, Mookie Cooper is very much a jitterbug, get him out in space. Dominic Lovett is let him run a nine route, get, get downfield and catch the ball. Towski Dove is kind of your possession guy. You know, he'll get you six yards. Um, you know, Chance Looper, JJ Hester, they've, they seem to be dynamic athletes, but they just haven't put, put it together yet. So everybody's trying to punch above their weight. Everybody's being asked to do more than what they're comfortable doing. And that's led to a passing offense for the past two years. It's just been efficiency based. Some people might say, oh, it's just bad. You can call it bad. Oh, okay. It's efficiency based. It's going to get you, if you need three yards, it's going to get you three yards. If you need five yards, it'll get you four yards. It's safe. It's, you know, short, but it's getting yards that you want for successful plays. If you're asking the passing game to, to blow it open and get an explosive play, that's not, we don't have those guys yet. We don't have the scheme yet. Uh, maybe don't even have the quarterback yet, but who knows? Um, so having burden in there, who can do it all? Who can actually do it all? He, he's the number one receiver for a reason. That gives everybody room to cook at their own speed, whatever they want to do. Now Mookie Cooper can be the screen guy. Now Dominic Lovett can be the nine route guy. Now everyone can be more comfortable and not have to feel like they have to do more than what they are naturally going to do. You still need a quarterback who can throw the ball to them accurately. You still need an offense that schemes guys open to make explosive plays. But this is going to make it, we think, is going to make this passing game way, way more dynamic uh, just by the fact that you got the number one receiver on the field who will probably be the best player on the field, I don't know, 75% of the time. Um, and it's going to make everybody, the defense have to pay attention to them. Uh, it's it's going to open. It should open everything up, and if it doesn't, then we have some serious questions. Now, aside from the the five star Luther Burden, is there a player that stands out to you that uh, you believe will make the biggest impact for Missouri on the field, specifically next season? So, I mean, to answer your question directly, it's going to be Tavoris Jones, who is a four star running back out of El Paso. Um, wanted to go to Texas, was a Texas kid since he was born. He nothing wanted nothing more than play for the Longhorns. And they said, we don't have any room for you. So uh, he's now a Missouri Tiger. He is walking into a running back room that is young and unproven. And it kind of felt like this 2021 season was, yes, Tyler Beatty's last season, but it was also a chance for Elijah Young, who registered last year, um, to kind of make a statement as a solid number two. And what we saw instead was a walk-on named Michael Cox get all of those get all of those reps. So we, at this point, this running back room's got a bunch of dudes in it and, and no one who's kind of like the guy. So you insert a blue chip running back from Texas. Guess what? He's probably going to be the guy or one of the guys who's going to be getting starting level snaps, who's going to have an immediate impact who's going to be on the field in a way that you can say, okay, yeah, this, this is how he makes this team better. This is how he makes this offense better because buddy, you have seen this tiger offense the past two years. It is running back heavy. So 
Uh, if they can't find one guy, they certainly have two guys, three guys who can do that, and everyone's going to get their shot. But Tavoris Jones comes in with the most, uh, the highest pedigree of all of them. And how long do you think it will be before it's uh, realistic for uh, four-star quarterback Sam Horn to to be in discussion to be Missouri's starting quarterback? I know they've got quite a few talented arms down there in Columbia now. And do you ever recall Missouri landing the number nine quarterback in the country? And it's kind of like ho hum. I mean it. <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's just a wild time to me. It is. Um, not a whole lot of blue chip quarterbacks who, yeah, kind of get uh, second billing, uh, especially at Missouri. Uh, Drew Locke kind of was that because he he committed early and then he was the he was kind of the crown jewel of the class. And then Terry Beckner Jr. Um, committed the day of and he kind of became the guy. Um, but yeah, you know, guess what? Uh, Sam Horn has all of the tools to be a starting sec quarterback the issue that you're running into right now is that drinkwitz for the past two years has shown with his actions that basilac is his guy just flat out even at 70 percent and injured he would prefer to trot out basilac than brady cook or tyler macon so what we're running into that stubbornness and that's why i'm hesitant to think that we're going to see sam horn you know snap one of game one i do think well, let me re- let me rephrase that. I hope that Drinkwood sees the opportunity here and rotates in Horn um, for for getting some reps, especially in the early you know the first two games where we're at Middle Tennessee and at Kansas State. Get him in there and see what he can do. He has got the similar skill set to Basilak with the addition of he can and will run, and mm-hmm. oh by the way can hit the deep ball. So. It's kind of like you're getting a rich Connor, rich man's Connor Bayslack. So if you're going to roll out Bays, that's fine. But I want to make sure that he gets uh, some, some, some series in there too. It is my hope that by the time we get to the end of 2022, Sam Horn is your guy. Bayslack has, you know, re- seated the reins, maybe transferred. I don't know. Um, but I, I don't anticipate leaving spring practice with four quarterbacks on the roster. I do anticipate some transfers. I don't know who. But kind of depending on that is when the quarterback depth shakes out. But I certainly think Sam Horn is going to be the best of them. Because Missouri got such a, you know, historically great class. I, I wanted to ask you, and maybe this is, uh, you know, this may be a tough one to, to answer, but do you credit that more to Drinkowitz and his, and his coaching staff doing a great job? Or is this a historically great year of in-state talent? As I know, as soon as he, you know, showed up, you know, he prioritized uh, the surrounding area, and that's what every coach says they they want to do, but they actually have gone out and done it. So uh, I don't know. Do you credit it to having so much elite talent around, or, or is it more just the coaches just working uh, so hard on the recruiting trail, do you think? I mean, kind of like with anything, the answer is going to be both. Um, you really – it was kind of – it was 2018 was the first really, like, greatest recruiting class ever in the state of Missouri. Now I'm going to list off a couple of names and a lot of these you're going to go who, but Trevor Trout, Michael Thompson, Mario Goodrich, Ronnie Perkins, Cameron Babb, Daniel Parker, Jr. Dallas Cradith. All those guys were four stars. That was the most blue chip talent in the state of Missouri ever. Hmm. Now Barry Odom at the time was coming off of a seven and six season where he started one and six. So guess what? They really weren't all that interested. Trevor Trout went to USC. Mike Thompson went to Oklahoma. Mario Goodrich went to Clemson. Ronnie Perkins, you probably remember that name of all of them. He was drafted by the Sooners or out of out of Oklahoma uh, mm-hmm. as a defensive end. Uh, Cameron Babbitt, Ohio State's kind of a bit player. Uh, but Daniel Parker Jr. was the only one that signed with Missouri. He was the only four-star who did it. And he was a defensive end and he switched to tight end. So that was kind of the biggest like, okay, there's a lot of talent here. Then 2019, it's a similar thing. Isaiah Williams, probably don't remember him, but Jamison Williams mm-hmm. of Alabama, who started Ohio State. You got Jelani Williams who signed with Missouri, Marcus Washington, who's playing at Texas. And then in 2020, you got more. You got Jordan Johnson, who went to Notre Dame. Mookie Cooper went to Ohio State, came to Missouri. Dante Manning, Antonio, Antonio Doyle Jr. Like, there is a lot of talent in Missouri, is my point. And previous staffs, you know, the Pinkle staff could get one or two. Odom couldn't get any of them. 
Drinkwitz is backing this up by being an incredible pitch man. And then, oh, also, by the way, emphasizing Kansas City and St. Louis recruiting. So the issue with the cities, especially St. Louis, is that there's been a lot of distrust between the city and the school that stems from the 90s and how those staffs treated the kids from St. Louis. That's been a long process to mend those fences. It started with Pinkle. It didn't do so great with Odom, but Drinkwitz and his staff have done a great job of emphasizing the importance of those two cities and the suburbs and the surrounding areas. And so now that there is talent, there's always been talent, but now that there's blue chip talent and those relationships are established and the staff is going after them, you put those three things together. That's where you start getting your magical recruiting gumbo. And now we're really paying off with those relationships and all that effort because these kids are here and now they think it's cool to go to Mizzou, which has not been the case for the past 30 years. <laughs> all right, last recruiting question for you. I'm sure you saw it, but uh, wanted to get your thoughts on Drinkowitz in his press conference, I mean, I'd say he challenged the fans and prominent boosters to say, hey, we got Fortune 500 companies here with uh, now that we're in the uh, NIL era and, uh, you know, he wants the fans to, to support the team and fill those stands. What, what was your thoughts uh, when you saw that from uh, Coach Drinkwitz? I was all about it. I, I'm fully in, in favor of that. And that's, that's a stance that Rock M Nation has taken. And we have been pilloried for taking that stance. We've been saying that we've been fan shaming uh, a lot of bad faith arguments being made about this, but here's the deal. Your, your listenership knows this. Ask anybody in Tuscaloosa, ask, ask anybody in Auburn, Tallahassee, like it, you can make a difference with your dollar. And that's something that the South understands and that we are trying to kind of figure out. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's go, look at Clemson, right? The, 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 the IPTE program, the I pay 10 a year, every mm -hmm. single alum pays $10 a year to the athletics program. That's all they ask. Now they also leverage, you know, multi-million dollar donations <laughs> and all that stuff. But like, if you can create a consistent solid base from your alumni, uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, but if you can create that, that gives you money to play with, especially in the area of NIL, <clears throat> where you can put together some pretty interesting packages uh, for compensation, for advertising, or what have you, uh, and lure these recruits to your school. Drink with saying that out loud, I applaud it. It's not something that I think a lot of coaches would be willing to do, or they do it in a negative manner, like looking at you, Gary Patterson. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just being Frank. Like he's, he understands that this is the show me state, which I always roll my eyes at that. But like, we know that you got to show something for us to buy in. And he said, I'm working on the product. Something you can do is give us some more money to play with, to improve that product faster. And uh, what we said on the podcast uh, yesterday, was like, at some point, Missouri fans just need to buy in with faith instead of buy in with proof. Uh, that's just the sec is too competitive. It's too talented to sit on your hands and just scowl until your team gets better. And then you give them money. <laughs> like it's gotta, you gotta have both at the same time. So I am mm -hmm. very happy that he said it out loud. I hope that turns into actual dollars for the program. I am going to do my part and donate to the tiger scholarship fund. I hope any of Missouri fans who listen to this show do the same thing, but we got to get those coffers filled and it doesn't have to be a lot, but it's gotta be more than what we're currently giving. And I hope that, 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 that does change in the near future. All right, last thing for you, Nate. Uh, really appreciate all the time, but hey, we got a bowl game here. And oh, this, we do. <laughs> this will be the first SEC bowl game of, of bowl season here. It's on, uh, I believe, yeah, Wednesday, December 22nd against Army. Mm -hmm. How in the heck Missouri ended up in the Armed Forces Bowl? I will, I'll never know. But, uh, you know, on paper, maybe a nightmare matchup considering Army rushes for 286 yards per game. Mm -hmm. We all know Missouri's issues there, but you know, let's credit this defensive staff because the last month of the season, uh, they kind of clean that up. They're not elite by any means, but they're not abysmal either uh, <laughs> defending the run. So, and they're going to have several weeks to practice, get ready for this, uh, this army rushing attack. What's your thoughts on uh, the armed forces bowl and, and can Missouri escape with the win here? Missouri defense, not abysmal is a, is a hell of a slogan, but that's down <laughs> where we're at. Um, Look, Army makes teams look really stupid. That's kind of what the service academies do. They trot out a bunch of unranked two-star guys, and they just they beat you by tactic and scheme. Um, 
Missouri has not done well with the triple option historically. I mean, obviously the last thing I can really think about it would be the Navy bowl game in 2009, where they just ran us off the field. Um, it takes efforts. It takes uh, really, really smart play, um, knowing your assignments. And it's, it's hoping that you can, you can win in a rock fight. Um, the defensive line has, has obviously kind of struggled against the run. Uh, they've, they've cleaned that up, but linebackers were also out of position. Got, they were out of position playing Central Michigan and Tennessee, let alone mm -hmm. uh, a triple option team, which specializes in making linebackers be out of position. So it's not going to be great. It's going to be uncomfortable. I, I, I'm not – if Missouri wins, it's going to be close. I went back through all of Army's bowl games over the past decade. It doesn't matter who they play. Everything's a one-possession game. Well, except for Houston, which clearly gave up. Um <laughs> But they, they play one possession games. That's how they're decided. And uh, they've beaten mo much better teams in Missouri. However, they've not beaten a power five opponent in a bowl game. So that's my, that's the thread I'm hanging on to for dear life here. I do think that, uh, you know, Tyler Beatty is going to go out with a bang. Um, even if this army defense is good at stopping the run, I think he, he, he can break through good defenses kind of no matter mm -hmm. what. Uh, I think it's going to be a little more pointsy than you might think. I'll probably pick Army 31-28, uh, but we'll we'll see. I know this team is motivated to win, especially after being snubbed from bowls for the past two years, even though being eligible. So uh, it's kind of about motivation, and if they're motivated to win, I think they can, but uh, Army's going to make it very, very ugly. Oh, my gosh, Nate, I forgot one thing. I know I said last question, but I, real sure. quick. Eli Drinkwitz, may the force be with you. I haven't, I haven't asked you about that. I, I mean, I love it. I love any, any oh, petty this week and get in college football. What, what'd you think of that? I loved it. I, <laughs> I loved it. the delivery was terrible. The setup was kooky. It was forced, and I don't care because Dan Mullen sucks. I think everybody on this podcast will agree to that. Now he sucks as a person. He sucks as a coach. And to be able to stick it right in his eye with the same <laughs> joke he made 365 days earlier, like, mm. oh, that was just, that was so sweet. And it's very sweet. And I'm glad it happened. And then I'm glad he got fired because that, 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 it's just perfect. All right. And that's a perfect ending to this interview. So he's Nate Edwards. Give him a follow at Nate G Edwards. Follow him over at uh, Rock M Nation, all the content they're doing over there. And don't forget to check out the podcast. I listen to every episode on the Rock M Nation before the box score podcast. Nate, I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Mike. M-I-Z. All right, so just want to say thanks again to Nate for joining the show. Man, hey, this one went long with uh, three interviews. We'll try to, like I said, I'm going to try to knock these out all week, leading up to the holidays, and we're going to have more. I've reached, reached out to A&M, Arkansas, Auburn, Kentucky, those are the, probably the next ones that you're going to see hitting the podcast. We've also got uh, a special guest coming on the show to preview each and every SEC bowl game and the opponents that the SEC teams are facing off. So, hey, it's the holidays, but we ain't going nowhere. Just went on vacation, so I can't afford to take another one anytime soon. We're going to be coming at you all week long here with uh, SEC content. For I know a lot of people are going to be traveling, so you're going to need some content to get you through those commutes, and we're going to be here taking care of you all week long. So I do appreciate each and every one of you, and hope to see you soon. We'll catch you on the next one.